hate Shakespeare. Oh, that's right, I said it. No, I do, I hate Shakespeare. Hello and welcome to our podcast that we are entitling How to Read Shakespeare in 18 Easily Understood Steps. Yes, a bit of sarcasm in there as Shakespeare is one of the more difficult things we will be reading in high school, but we wanted to try and give you some tips and tricks to help you through any of the Shakespeare pieces you might be reading in the next four years. So first off, why should we even care about Shakespeare? First off, even though many of his plays were written 400 years ago, many of the basic story structures of things we see in today's society come from his works. The idea of star-crossed lovers, or lovers who cannot be together in some way because society or families or circumstances have kept them apart, stems from Shakespeare and some of his works. The idea of characters using mistaken identities or creating dramatic irony-filled situations where one character is in disguise or not revealing of themselves to another, Again, all of those stem from Shakespeare. Additionally, we have found that many American institutions, high schools in specific, love to teach Shakespeare as their form of drama. So if you're going to go through an American high school, at some point you're probably going to be reading some Shakespeare, so why not do a little practice with it? And additionally, if we're just looking at the live theater aspect of real theater in actual theaters today, Shakespeare continues to be the most produced playwright in America. So even though we're having tons of new things being written, even though there are hundreds if not thousands of other great playwrights out there, we continue to see on Broadway, off-Broadway, and in the heartland of America, we tend to see Shakespeare being produced and Shakespearean plays being put on stage. And so to illustrate some of the impact on pop culture that Shakespeare has had, just take a look at some of these titles. If you've read Hamlet, you are probably seeing echoes of that in Disney's The Lion King. The idea of a brother killing a brother, assuming the throne, etc. Additionally, Romeo and Juliet, oftentimes a high school favorite, has been adapted into such tales as the animated Nomeo and Juliet, the musical West Side Story, and then, of course, the great zombie film, Warm Bodies. Additionally, Taming of the Shrew becomes Ten Things I Hate About You with the late Heath Ledger. Othello becomes a more modernized version in the movie O. And then even within any of the Shakespearean plays, we often see the various forms and modifications that are made to the original while still staying relatively close in those adaptations. So for example, here we have eight different versions of the play Hamlet. Some are filmed very much like they are on a stage. Others are translated word for word, so they end up being hours and hours long. Others take a more modern approach, where again, we have the basic story of Hamlet, but we're going to modernize it, perhaps using guns instead of swords, etc. But clearly, these Shakespearean stories resonate with modern audiences to the current day, because if they weren't resonating, people wouldn't make them, people wouldn't adapt them, people wouldn't continue to pay money to see them on any sort of level stage. Ultimately, our goal with this presentation is to help you to become more independent readers of Shakespeare. I know oftentimes in high school, reading Shakespeare is laborious. It is very difficult. And oftentimes the teacher will read a couple lines, stop and ask the students, hey, what did they say? People will sit there for 30 seconds not knowing what's going on, and then the teacher will translate it and simply tell the students what's going on. And I understand for maybe your first or second exposure to Shakespeare that that's probably how this is all going to go down, but as you get more versed in it, as you become upperclassmen, the hope is that you can become more independent readers without having the teacher hover over your shoulders translating everything for you. Our hope is that you can become more independent. Additionally, as you become more competent in reading Shakespeare, we're hoping that you're going to be able to build enough context to understand the layers and the complexity of Shakespeare. We want you to get past just the plot level of what happened and who killed who and who's in disguise, etc. We really want you to be able to begin that look at the levels of language that Shakespeare uses, the words he's created, the puns and similes and metaphors he has used, which are really rich and full of life, 
even now as we read them 400 years after they were produced. The challenges to reading Shakespeare are many. Number one, we speak in prose. We just speak how we talk. We use subject, verb, object, order. We don't try to make our speech have rhythm or rhyme to it. And challengingly, Shakespeare does. So he is writing in verse, which is basically poetry. And no, this isn't how regular Elizabethan Englanders spoke at the time, even back in the late 1500s, but this is what he wrote in. And so it is rather foreign to us because he's writing in verse, which is poetry, and we tend to speak in prose. Additionally, he wrote in iambic pentameter. So this is 10 syllables per line with an unstressed, stressed pattern that is then repeated five times per line to make a grand total of 10 syllables. So sometimes you're going to see that he has manipulated word order or word choices or how you're supposed to pronounce words even in order to maintain that poetic iambic pentameter pattern. Finally, Shakespeare's vocabulary includes around 30,000 words. Today, our vocabularies are much smaller. We commonly use between 6,000 and 15,000 words if you're really cranking up your vocabulary and word choice. Additionally, now that we're in the age of technology, how many words do we actually use to communicate when we're texting and emailing friends? Also, think about how much we read and what levels of things we read for pleasure outside of those texts that are assigned for school. If we're not reading at all, our vocabularies are going to stay pretty static. They're not going to grow. If we're reading very simple things for our grade level, we're probably just reinforcing what we already know. If we are choosing more difficult, more complex texts, then perhaps our vocabularies will grow. But still, Shakespeare dwarfs ours in terms of the words he used and the words he made up. So oftentimes, they're not even things that make sense, but we just have to kind of go with it and figure it out as we go through. So now let's talk about some of the individual challenges we see to Shakespeare's writings. So the first one we're looking at, we're calling Shakespeareisms, this idea of the older English version of common words that we see today. For example, the means you. When will I see the next? Meaning, when will I see you next? Another form of you is thou. When it's used as the subject, you might see the word thou, as in thou art a villain. You are a villain. Thy is going to be your, hath is going to be has, and then tons of words that have apostrophes, words that have been cut off or interrupted or used as contractions, similar to what we have today. For example, a couple, tis is the same as it is, ope is open, oft, often, and so the general rule is if you see an apostrophe, it's it's probably some sort of contraction like did not equaling didn't in today's English. A large challenge to sh reading Shakespeare is the idea that his grammatical structures don't mirror how we speak today. Again, we speak in prose. We just talk. We just use subject, verb, object patterns, where oftentimes he's going to manipulate his grammatical structures in order to fit a rhythm, to fit a rhyme, or to make some other rhetorical purpose. So first off, we often have to see that the parts of speech are sometimes manipulated. Shakespeare is going to use nouns or adjectives as verbs, or verbs and subjects that don't even agree with each other. So for example, Within my mouth you have enjailed my tongue, doubly portcullised with the teeth and lips. To enjail is like to capture as if to put into a jail. And we don't often use the word jail as a verb, but here he has. Grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I'm not really sure what the verb to uncle is, but in this case, in Richard II, he's using the noun uncle as a verb. And so related to this, normal sentence order is often varied, like I said before, to maintain rhythm or rhyme. 
So for example, I ate the sandwich. Oh, that makes sense. But then he might also use I the sandwich ate, ate the sandwich I, ate I the sandwich, the sandwich I ate, the sandwich ate I. And so all of those are clearly different structures of the same four words. But in Shakespeare's world, those would all mean slightly different things. So we have to ask ourselves, is it truly about a character eating a sandwich? Is it truly about the sandwich eating the character? Or is this some sort of metaphorical play on words that Shakespeare's trying to make? Towards him I made, but he was aware of me and stole into the covert of the wood. So again, a character saying that I walked toward him, but that character was aware of me, and so that character went into the cover of the wood. So early walking did I see your son. Again, early on, Benvolio speaking in Romeo and Juliet, rather than just say, I was out walking, I saw your son. We get this different structure than we're used to seeing. So we may need to kind of unjumble the words, really figure out who's doing the action, and then figure out what action they're doing, and perhaps kind of reorder that a little bit in our head in order to figure out what's going on. Additionally, another grammatical structure we have to deal with is that sometimes words are omitted or implied. So for example, from Romeo and Juliet, I neither know it nor can learn of him, really is, I neither know the cause of it, nor can I learn about it from him. So we have to look at that and go, well, who's actually doing the action? What are they doing? And then who is receiving that action? And so you might have to twist some things around, do some inferencing when he has left out words in order to make the sentence make sense. Some of the more difficult challenges are those revolving around Shakespeare's word play. So his use of similes and metaphors. These are the things that make his language rich and interesting and have created some of the most beautiful word images we've seen in the English language, but they do play havoc for young students. If we're not used to thinking metaphorically, if we're not searching those out, if we're not actively searching for them, we sometimes miss these beautiful similes because we're stuck at the comprehension level. Like, what's even going on? We're not able to then say, okay, this is going on, and he's showing us how it's going on through the simile or through the metaphor or through some other structures that we'll show you. So, for example, I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. So here, the king is comparing Macbeth to a tree that he can plant and watch grow. This sort of nurturing relationship that we can see how the characters grow and care for each other. Additionally, Shakespeare is famous for using puns. And a pun is just a joke playing on the fact that English words have different meanings or that there are words which sound alike but have different meanings. So for example, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. So sun drives away the winter like sun, S-U-N or S-O-N, meaning the descendants of the house of York from Richard III. So when we are reading and we are seeing words that are spelled similarly, we have to ask ourselves, should we be pronouncing them similarly? And additionally, how do these words meanings relate to each other? Might Shakespeare be spinning together a long winded pun to have some fun with words, but then also make some sort of deeper point. Another word play that Shakespeare is common for is a malapropism, which is the mistaken use of a word in place of a similar sounding word often with unintentionally amusing effect. So for example, the common one given is to dance a flamingo, which is a type of bird, when one probably meant someone is going to dance a flamenco, which is a Latin American type of dance. So an example from Romeo and Juliet, the nurse tells Romeo that she needs to have a confidence with him when she should have said conference, you know, two people talking. And then Benvolio responds, making fun, that she probably will indict 
rather than invite. Indict meaning charge with a crime. Invite meaning, you know, invite. Allow someone to come to dinner. Additionally, Shakespeare uses a lot of double entendre. And double entendre is a kind of pun in which the word or phrase has that double meaning, but usually that second or double meaning is sexual in nature. So for example, Lady Capulet says, So shall you share all that he doth possess by having him making yourself no less? And then the comic character of the nurse says, No less, nay bigger, women grow by men. And so using the word grow by men to imply that women will get bigger when they are pregnant, which they were probably made so by the man in the story. So women grow bigger when they are pregnant. Now, the other thing we need to think about is that the Shakespearean plays are going to mirror Elizabethan society in terms of the types of characters that they have. So Elizabethan society was pretty regimented. It was not really possible to move up the levels of society. Whatever you were born into, that's where one would stay. We're going to have the levels of class such as the monarchs, the nobility, the gentry, merchants, the yeomen, which are going to be farmers, tradesmen, and then the laborers. So we're going to see that this very strict Elizabethan structure exists in the world of Elizabethan England at the time that Shakespeare was writing, and that's going to be mirrored in the Shakespearean plays. So we are going to see the high characters such as monarchs and nobles, and we're going to see the low characters such as yeomen and laborers, and they're going to speak according to their rank in society. And so to illuminate what that looks like, when we have high class characters, they're going to speak in a certain way, and that way typically is the idea of a rhyming couplet. So a couplet is two lines that are back to back, and they're going to rhyme at the end. So this will stand out because oftentimes the rhymes at line by line are a little bit more spread out. Sometimes the lines don't rhyme at all. But when we do have a, a lord, a lady, some sort of high class character, oftentimes they speak in couplets. So this will reveal or remind us, absolutely, we are reading a high class character here. We should also keep in mind that if we get that rhyming couplet idea spoken from another character who isn't really high class, perhaps that character is trying to be more high class, trying to sound above their rank. So if we have one of these goofball characters, these lower class characters speaking in couplets, we should be aware and just conscious of what they might be trying to do in terms of their speech. And oftentimes those lower class characters will screw it up and use that malapropism or some sort of double entendre intentionally or not because they're trying to be high class, but they're really not. Additionally, we're going to have lower class characters and they will speak in a certain way. They tend to be a little bit more body. They tell the dirty jokes kind of thing. And those characters might be grave diggers, fools, clowns, nurses, etc. And because they are lower class, they are seen as the fool, seen as the comic relief. But oftentimes, they have the most genius insights into life within the play. So while the grave diggers of Hamlet are making all kinds of goofball jokes and don't seem to be making much sense and are confusing to Hamlet to an extent, they are offering some of the more bright insights into what life really is about. Because think about it, these are lower class characters who would have lived, who would have worked, who would have struggled. They would have really seen what life was like in this Renaissance Elizabethan period as contrasted to those who are in higher class, who are being served, who are being attended to. They don't really know what the world is like. So based on their patterns, when we see these lower class characters, we have to acknowledge that they are lower class based on some of the body lines they make, some of the mistakes they make in terms of their malapropisms or puns, etc. But then also look for them to create some really great insight into life and living as a whole. And then additionally, as we've alluded to, Shakespearean plays needed to appeal to all ranks of society. 
So the theater was a great leveling place where all levels of society would mix and mingle and be in the same place at the same time. So Shakespeare's plays had to have this high language that might appeal to the nobility, but also kind of the low, dirty, body humor that would appeal to the groundlings, the really poor people who wouldn't actually be able to afford a seat. They would just come in and stand on the ground of the theater. So finally, how do we actually read the words that then allow us to pause, reflect, and kind of figure out what he's saying plot-wise, but then also figure out what he's saying metaphorically? One tip is read to the end punctuation. Don't read line by line and just stop because the line is over. Try to read those three or four lines and get to a period. Really link those sentences together. Number two read it aloud. Shakespearean plays originally were not written down. They were meant and continued to be meant to be performed. It is a lot easier to understand Shakespeare if you see it in person. And since we can't always do that, we have to either watch the movie, which is a great idea, but we also are trying to read through it, which is the most difficult thing to do. So the more you can read it out loud and put certain emphasis on the words that you're understanding or the plot structures that you're getting, that will be helpful. Additionally, infuse those short pauses when you reach commas, longer pauses when you reach periods, colons, semicolons, etc., and really chunk these lines out. Pause here, really full stop here, allow that to settle in there. And then the last piece of advice is don't try to translate every line word for word. It's like when we're taking a world language in high school. It's not a great idea to take a sentence that we've read in Spanish, drop it into Google Translate, and have it translate word for word. While we might you know, get an answer or two right on a Spanish test, we're not really getting it. The better way to learn world languages is to just release a little bit and immerse yourself in it. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to use the wrong tense. You're going to use the wrong vocab word, but that's how you learn. Oftentimes students who go away and study abroad come back a lot more competent in those languages because they're not worried about word for word issues. They're just letting it go and immersing themselves. And I would pass on the same advice with Shakespeare. Don't try to translate word for word or even line by line. Use big chunks to try and figure out what was going on, who actually did something, and then how are they saying it, getting to that metaphorical level of the language. Just really let yourself go. And usually plays get easier as you get into them. By Acts 4 and 5, you're really figuring out the speech patterns of the characters. You've kind of understood the basic plot to this point. So you can really enjoy the language that he's using to create these great images, to create some funny jokes. So I think that's about it. Thanks for watching and listening. I hope this makes Shakespeare a little bit more easily understood. I know it's going to be difficult if you're reading for the first time in middle school or early high school, but perhaps by the time you get to be an upperclassman, you've read one, two, or maybe three Shakespearean plays and the patterns become a little bit more familiar to you. Again, just immerse yourself in Shakespeare. Let it go. You don't need to translate every single word, or every single sentence. See if you can figure out the plot, but then also get to that language level and really enjoy some of the great writing that he did, both for his time and for the current day, because it's still relevant. We still find value in Shakespeare. Thanks so much. If you have any questions, go ahead and bring those in, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.